Hello, good evening and uh, and welcome to the latest edition of the National Roadshow, the second virtual one that, that we're holding. I'm delighted to be joined tonight by Mike Russell, uh, I get this right, political director of the SNP's HQ Independence Unit. Uh, Mike, as you all know, has had a, a very distinguished career at Holyrood, latterly as the, the, the Brexit uh, Constitution Secretary during a, a, an incredibly busy time in, in Scottish and UK politics, and we'll probably talk a bit about that later on. Um, Mike, how are you adjusting to life after being an MSP? Oh, I'm adjusting to it pretty well. I mean, I have to say there is, is life beyond being an MSP. Um, I had perhaps thought I might have a slightly quieter time, but I'm happy to do what I can on the on the independence front. I mean, I'm, as president of the SNP, that's why I'm doing it, having been asked to do it in that role, to try and help the HQ and to help the party sharpen up what is happening in independence, build it again after the pandemic and work towards the time that we'll have a a second referendum. Yeah, we, we we've done a couple of uh, a couple of these events in, in person before. We had a, we were just chatting about it before we came on. We had a lovely time in, in Isla, um, uh for the agricultural show. We were over and uh, we've done one in Dunoon as well, which I think I think you were at. Um, we also yeah. did look Guildhead in Campbellton, but I'm not I'm not sure. You, I don't think you were at those ones. But um, a, a, a brilliant uh, place in the world, uh, anyway, where you are. Um, and, and doing this virtually is is good. It's got advantages, isn't it? Because it's going to be seen by uh, a lot of people tonight. Hopefully, there's there's around 200 kind of tuning in already. I can see up in the top left corner there, and 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 hopefully that will grow as the night goes on. Um, but unfortunately, there's no tea and biscuits being served by us. But in life, if you want to make them yourselves, well, everybody just go ahead. And in and in Isla, more than tea and biscuits, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, was, the yeah. agricultural show was yes. added to me. It was um, it, mm -hmm. the Isla show is always absolutely fantastic. I was yeah. in Isla last week. I booked for the show. The show uh -huh. was cancelled again, but it's always great to be in Isla. And particularly with the SNP branch in Isla, who are a fantastic group and are working incredibly hard. Yeah, yeah, a lovely, lovely tasting night. I think it was, wasn't it? Um, okay, so everyone, uh, everyone out there, please get involved in the comments. We're going to put them up on the screen, just like they are below. Um, and for those of you who aren't already subscribers to the National, what are you doing? But there's a there's a special offer there. Uh, uh, rolling along the the bottom of the screen with a with a discount code for for the annual subscription. So so please do sign up if you like what we do, because it's uh, it's our subscribers that, that that allows us to do things like this. And hopefully we can we can do a few more going forward. Right. Okay. Let's just get started. We've got tons of reader questions. We are open to 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 people commenting and, and giving us a few more. Um, but we'll try and get through as many as possible. No promises. Okay. Nicola Sturgeon, when she uh, appointed you to your new role. Or oh, sorry, when you were appointed to the new role, because I think it was approved by the NEC, wasn't it? So she said, uh, Mike will oversee the development of the party's independence campaign as we look ahead to IndyRef2 later in the parliament. So what, so what is your job then? How is it? Um, what was your brief? What did, what did the, the first minister say? What's she looking for you to do? Well, it, exactly that. I mean, you know, we've had a pandemic and you know it's difficult. Nobody's going to forget that. But we've had the pandemic. Work ceased in government on the 16th of March, uh, 2020. Um, and it has not as yet restarted. The only work that's been done was to produce the referendum bill, the draft referendum bill, which I did before the end of the last session. Now we need to start building again to prepare ourselves so that we are ready for a campaign. Sometimes in Scotland, and I've, I've said this to you before, sometimes in Scotland we feel we have to have ask permission. We wait until something happens. I see myself as trying to provide information trying to G up activity within the party, trying to make the contacts again with other yes organizations, uh, willing all of us to build the case, to build the campaign, to get the information, to encourage people to work for independence, to get out there, to talk to their friends and neighbors uh, as they can to campaign in the streets so that we are ready. And that's what we started to do in the last six weeks. I think I've, I think I've been doing the job for, for two months. We've been mailing every party member every fortnight with new information, with information they can use with others. Uh, we've included a, you know, a, a big eight-page leaflet, which some branches and, and constituencies have produced and are beginning to distribute. Um, we, I've been talking to other yes groups. I've been talking to organizations. And I've been looking forward to the conference we're going to have in early September, where we will debate the issues of independence again, get it back, uh, uh, back on the front foot. We'll go into the autumn, intending to, to do even more. And when we get to the end of the year, I hope we'll be fighting fit in terms of, of the campaign. We can't put out of the way the pandemic. It's been immensely serious. It's stopped things happening and it's not over. And the question of when the referendum will be and there will be a referendum is one for the government and the parliament. What I can do is put what help I can 
to those people working in HQ and the branches of constituencies to push the issue on again. And that's what I'm going to do, working as the party president, because that's my role on the elected role and elected by the members as the party president. So, so the, the independent unit at HQ then, is that, does, it have, does it have a few staff kind of dedicated to this, well, to working on the... I think, I think what, a lot of the time what yeah. people want to know is that there is, you know, there's, there's, there's busy work kind of happening behind the yeah. scenes. I've got, there's some fantastic people working on independence. I mean, you know, look at Ross Cahoon, who's doing the social media stuff. He spends an awful lot of time in his independent, uh, in independence. At the present moment, we've got staff in HQ working on HQ staff who are working on independence. And we've got others, you know, who, who work for HQ who do that part of their time. My intention would be to build that stuff into a distinctive campaigning team over the autumn and into the winter uh, so that we are then ready to move things forward. Um, and you know, all that is taking place, as is you know, the work that's being done to say, what is the message? Some of that work has to be done in government. Some of that work relates to government and governmental activity. Some of that work can be done by other people. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, the national, and, and I'm going to be strongly in praise of the national because I think it's a really important part of the wider independence uh, activity. But, you know, Elliot, Elliot Bulmer has been writing for you and he's been writing about his view that there should be work towards some sort of interim constitution. That is work, I think, that the SNP should be involved with, even if it doesn't lead, and therefore we're encouraging that to happen. And there's other things happening too. So I think this is, this is rebuilding after a very difficult time. It is rebuilding to make sure we're ready and it is empowering members to be able to us to say the right things and to argue argue the right to, the, the right way and that's very helpful but just let's get on with it let's do things so uh, we so, so, so the message is you know we're not the, the, the after effects of the pandemic and the, the the legacy of it will be around for for a long time but now that we're post level zero or post most restrictions um you, it's it's full steam ahead is it well, it's, it's getting full steam ahead. It will take time to move fully ahead. The pandemic's not away. I mean, we saw that from today's figures. If you look at today's figures, you know, a slight upturn again. We're still in a difficult position. We're, we're post level zero, but you know, this disease is still around. There are still difficulties with it. You couldn't hold, I see people saying, oh, well, we had an election during a pandemic, we can hold a referendum. You couldn't hold the type of conversion referendum the type of thing that we had in 2014 in these conditions, in my view. I mean, others may have a different view, but in my view, that's just impossible. So we have to prepare ourselves to have that type of campaign. And of course, we have a bill to pass, but you know, it's also wrong to say that nothing has happened. You know, we've got, the, 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 there need to be essentially three developments legislatively to have a referendum now. One is a referendum act, which I brought through the parliament and which was passed and all the arrangements were in place. Second one is a franchise act, and we now have the widest franchise, uh, one of the widest in the world. We're not waiting for Michael Gove to decide what the franchise is, that's settled. And the third is the referendum bill. Now, when we pass a referendum bill, it is, as our manifesto said, the intention to have that referendum, to put the ball in the UK government's court, to say that we have now a bill, the Scottish Parliament's decided to do so, it, we're going to do it, and if you want to stop it, you'd have to take us to court. Those are, those are big steps forward. And all those things have been happening. So, but we need to have a genuine, detailed campaign with a spaced and the and essentially the bread to have that campaign. And that can't be done while we have a pandemic underway. It's simply impossible. You can have an election. We showed that, but it wasn't a normal election. You know, talk to anybody who was campaigning, and it wasn't a normal election. We need to have the best opportunity to win the case, and we have to therefore arrange the time and how we approach that in the way that suits us best. Okay, well, I'm going to, obviously, as you know, we've had, we've had lots of questions from readers in, and that, and that question about the timing is, is probably the one that uh, was 75% of the, the submitted questions, yeah. but we'll, we'll come to that in a second. I just want to go back just to, the, to kind of give people a little bit of clarity about, about you, the independence unit, and what you do. So you're, you're not going to be, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you, you won't be responsible for writing a white paper on... No, that would be a government. government. It's, it's the campaign. I mean, that that would be government. government. Yeah, I'm succeeded in office by Angus Robertson. Uh, you know, immensely competent, you know, very experienced. That's Angus Robertson's job, not mine. Yeah, I'm also so you, retired. You know, I just want to make that point. Uh, what I'm doing as a volunteer is trying to use some of the experience I have, some of the work I've done, to essentially sharpen things up, organise things, get things moving, and and provide a, a little bit of of push 
to take us forward through this year and into next year. Okay. Um, timing. The, the, there's, a, there's a sweet spot, isn't there? Um, <coughs> between going too early and, uh, and, and missing, missing the boat. So in, you, in your view, personal view, when do you think the... <laughs> I'm not going to get tied down. Well done, Callum. I'm not going to get tied down to a day. I think I've made it clear. There needs to be the space to have a full campaign. Um, you can't do that during a referendum. The circumstances have to be ones in which we think you know, we can get the best result possible. I, I feel as frustrated as everybody else. And I know people you know, who've left the SNP because they feel so frustrated it hasn't happened. I fully understand that. I, I feel it myself. I would love this to be happening now, but it's not. And therefore, you know, I've been in this movement for, well, since I joined the party in, in 1974. I'm not going to throw it away, particularly the second chance of doing it. You know, I'm not going to throw that away until, you know, just because I feel impatient and nobody should. If we do this properly, if we do this step by step, if we do it in the right way and we do it legally, and that's very important in terms of recognition once we have done it and once we have won, then we can do it. But it's a difficult thing to do. I remember hearing Nicola McEwen saying this in something. Independence in the third decade of the 21st century in a, in a modern, sophisticated state, I mean, part of the UK isn't modern or sophisticated, but I make the point more widely, is a hard thing to do. And it's got to be done cleverly, it's got to be done well, it's got to be done thoughtfully, it's got to be timed properly. And people may not like that. They may wish to charge downhill. I fully understand that. I'd love to charge downhill too. But it would be an indulgence, which would mean that we would not win. And the one thing above all I am determined to do is to win. But there's, there's no change in the the, uh, the official stated uh, line that uh, the first the first half of the of this term of the parliament. That's is what still, the first minister is, said. Still they go. Uh, so they, so it's it's 2023, isn't it? It's early early 2023, well, midway 20. The moment is I it, start, is it earlier saying, than that? You know, the I start it's saying, my job to try to pin you down. On and it's my job know. not to be pinned down. So we we can do this forever. I mean, the, the first minister has said uh, in the first half. I think. You know, that is her prerogative. I think she is being cautious and she's right to be cautious. And in these circumstances, I'm playing my part in trying to make sure, so to speak, that the machine is moving and that the information is flowing and that people are raising their eyes. This is really important. Have hope that this is going to move forward, have raising their eyes and putting their effort into it. And that's what I'm doing. Okay, so timing aside, uh, maybe talk us through the the, the steps. So we've got, we've kind of got a question here from Rachel Wilmer, who, who who's asking, what are the legal routes to independence without a section thirty? Yeah. Well, uh, the legal route we laid out in the in in the manifesto, and and it's a it was a big change from where we'd been, and I don't think it got enough recognition um, because of other things that were happening. You know, previously we'd said, oh well, you know, we'll wait, we'll apply for a section thirty order, then we'll see what happens, and. You know, we had that court case and you know, the court case was, in my view, ill-conceived and you know, I, I think it was potentially very dangerous in terms of what it could have done. But I, I, what the manifesto said was, was a change, an important change. It said, look, we've we published a refer draft referendum bill that we're putting in front of the Scottish people and that's what we were asking you to support. That's what people did. And you know, with, with the Greens in the parliament, whatever the arrangement is, there is a majority for that bill. So that bill will be introduced at the time when the decision is made to move to a date. That bill will be introduced. That bill will, I think, pass. And then the arrangements for the referendum will be put into place. Um, you know, it will be up to the, the, the debate can take place. Dialogue can take place about Section 30 or anything else, but it will take place. And the only way the UK government can again say that is to go to court and to say you're not allowed to do that. Now, that's what they might try and do. And then we're in totally uncharted territory. But, you know, taking a government to court to stop them fulfilling a manifesto promise is not, in my view, a good look. And it changes the dimension of this problem because it, the ball is in the UK government's court. And it is a UK government that would forbid the people of Scotland to exercise self-determination. That is a very, very serious set of circumstances. I cannot predict what would happen then, but that's a change. And it's an important change. And it means the dynamic will be with us because we're going to move forward in that way. So those of us who, who watch closely every development, it's it's the bill that we need to kind of watch yeah. out for. That's the, yeah, yeah. The next, okay. the next stage would be the introduction of the bill. The bill exists in draft form. It's been published. It's very simple. 
Um, and the bill will, and this is a responsibility of government and parliament, and I'm in neither. So, you know, I will not be there to do that. But you know, at the, the appropriate stage, the bill will enter parliament. Uh, and have you spoken to Angus? Uh, what was the handover to Angus Robertson on, on the bill? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've spoken to Angus often, and uh, you know, Angus and I have known each other with, he, for a long time. You know, he is taking this on. He's taken the external affairs brief on too, and he's taken the cultural brief, which wasn't mine, which was Fiona's. Um, so, you know, he is now moving forward with that, and he will do so. And we we meet regularly, and we talk about these issues. Is it is it tough to do the, the to uh, the culture brief as well as the? As the I don't know. I, I I was last culture minister in two thousand and nine. I only had nine months as culture minister. I enjoyed it greatly, but I I was also constitution minister then too. I had. I had two two goes at constitution, yeah. and only one go at, at culture. And uh, Angus and Jenny Gilruth have taken on culture, and mm -hmm. I, I think we'll be very good at it. Okay, Let, let's let's um, mention the, the 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 big story of the day in terms of uh, independence, which is the 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 Jers figures. What, what did you make of it? Well, I, you know, I, I I tend to be with Kate Forbes on this, and you know, and and all the coverage over the years. The, the, Jers tells you only one thing: is that dependence doesn't work. That you know, it, it doesn't tell you anything about independence. It doesn't tell you anything about what would happen in independence. It tells you that dependence doesn't work. Um, there is also you know those people who know these things, and I'm not an economist. I'm more and more skeptical about chairs. I mean, the ones this year appear to to be playing some jiggery pokery with quantitative easing, uh, which I think is, is worth looking at again. It looks as if you know Scotland is having to pick up a share of something which you know the UK is not in the figures picking it up. But they don't mean anything. And, and indeed, you know, when you've got people, you know, there are former Scottish office economists, you know, who are saying this is a pointless exercise now. And all it is designed to do is to try and boost a, bolster the union. And as nobody believes them, it's not doing very much. So I treat them with considerable scepticism. But, you know, if they are meant to prove anything, they prove that we're not in an arrangement that is good for us. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the debate around independence and uh, it, it centred a lot on the on the process or it has um, been all, a lot about all the process and people obsess over how we get the referendum section 30 yeah. orders, various kind of the, the, the bill that we just spoke about there but um, I, we've had a lot of uh, uh, questions from from people, from Derek Marnock, from David Francis who, who, who want to know when we'll hear a bit more about what independence will be like and how it will have changed from the, the, the 2014 perspectives. What what work is being done behind the scenes? Is there anything you can update us on? Well, it's a really interesting question, this, because independence is about being able to do things differently. It's not insisting that certain things are done differently. It's about having that choice. And we need to say that to people. So it's a sort of two-stage process. But the SNP has not been quiet about this. I mean, I, last night I was talking to, 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 to Neil Gray and, and to Julie Hepburn about the Social Justice Commission report. And actually, the Social Justice Commission report tells you an awful lot about, first of all, how things can change in terms of how we make decisions, and then the type of things that could change. And we're not short of that. You know, people seem to be hanging around waiting, and it's a result of 2014, hanging around waiting for a white paper. You know, I've got one behind me here. And then once they've got the white paper, they can go out and give this to people. I, I, I was at a, a, a Yes Group meeting about two months ago. And, and, and there was somebody there who, who made a really important point. They said they'd gone from no to yes, not because they were guaranteed, you know, an extra bit of money through taxation or they felt, you know, um, you know thing that their, their family might be better off. They had a desire to see a better Scotland. And they could not imagine that happening with a Westminster government, particularly this Westminster government. So what they wanted to do was to have the mechanism available them to vote for and secure that better Scotland. And we can all say that. We can all go out and have that tomorrow. One of the things I'm trying to do in, in the work I'm doing you know, with the independence unit is to give people some of the raw material, for example, on pensions, on, on GDP, on, 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 on uh, productivity, and to say, we're not doing well. We need to envisage a time when we could do well. And the key to doing well is independence. One of the things we also need to do is to link the referendum and the choice we've got to make with the recovery we have to have after the pandemic. And that's really important. This is a referendum for recovery. This is a unique, pretty unique moment for, for Scotland, for almost every country. We now have to you know, build forward after the pandemic. 
and the choices we make are probably going to govern what happens for the next 30 or 40 years. And we need to be able to make those decisions ourselves, not to have the Boris Johnson make them. So oh, there's a lot of material around, but people shouldn't be, to use that good Scots word, blate about saying how they see independence. There's no one, one set of answers of what an independent Scotland is going to look like. But it's about being able to make the choices rather than being forbidden the opportunity to make the choices. Okay, well, uh, so you say there's, 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 there's plenty of material out there, and I agree with you on, on some of the stuff around the, the social justice reports. What? But you're right in saying that it, has that cut through to the wider public? And how do, you, how, do you, how do you make that cut through? Because the thing about the white paper was, <coughs> boom, here is you know, what independence is going to look like. And it's it's using that to kind of persuade the people who aren't like us, who aren't engaged with all these things and are, aren't obsessing about the independence debate every day. How do you make that cut through to the wider public? Well, I mean, that is a campaigning task. What you do is in a formal campaign, hopefully a reasonably, you know, a campaign with enough time and enough face-to-face -face time, is you're able to construct that. At the present moment, what we need to do is to be giving people essentially snippets and samples of, of how things can change. And, you, you, know, you know, speaking of your blushes, your paper does an awful lot of that. You know, your paper has been very, very good at providing information. I have a, a very close friend who was a no voter, who is now a yes voter. As a result of the, the campaign you ran, where people get the paper free for a period of time, because mm -hmm. they read the paper, they read things, they went on and read more things, and they discovered that they agreed with it. We can all do that, but we're all, you know, we're all ambassadors for independence too. Mm -hmm. you know, with, with the SNP membership, putting material into people's hands allows them to speak to other people about it. And that's why, you know, some of the negativity, some of the, you know, process negativity strikes me as, as counterproductive because what we should be having is each of us should be taking a positive take on this with the information we have and we'll fill in the rest of it. One of the things I want to do after the SNP conference is step back and say, we've provided this information over the last two months. How do we fill those gap, the gaps in to provide a more comprehensive package and who's going to do that work? And that's, I think, perfectly feasible to see that being done and during the autumn and into the winter. And, and what, what do you think will be the big issues of the next campaign and how will it differ from 2014? What will be the, the, uh, what, what will be the, the issues that, that, that you, the that people, the opposition will will take hold of and try and hammer you on. Well, you can see some of it today in the Jer stuff. You know, we're too poor, too wee, too stupid to to be able to. And we need to show how that is you know, absolutely not true. I mean, Brexit, you know, Brexit shows that what the UK is is stuck in a backwater and and moving further back into that backwater with you know low pensions, uh, with with low productivity, essentially not doing well. We need to make sure that we are arguing that case and giving that information. But you never know what the, the big topic of a campaign is going to be. You know, I, I can't remember who, whose it is, but you know, all generals fight the last war. You know, if we if we constantly obsess about being about currency, we're going to find something else is is a big issue. Now, the currency issue needs to be clearer, better explained, more robust in terms of how people can argue it. But some people will never be able to argue. I mean, I'm not an economist; it's very hard to argue. Borders is one that people look at, but in actual fact, one of the things I was doing in the last period before we suspended campaigning, as you know, was looking at the 35 chapters of accession to the EU and saying, if we can answer the questions that they raise, that defines our relationship after independence with, with, with England particularly, because I, I, we will be in the EU and they will not. So whatever their relationship is, is with the rest of the EU, it will be that same relationship. And that's very useful, for example, in things like borders. Because you know, the border situation with Ireland will have to be resolved. The UK will have to be able to resolve that, and it will have to be resolved. As that is resolved, then the same situation will apply for the border with Scotland. And there will be no people border because there's you know, a common travel area. So we need to be able to talk about that and to talk, and, and to talk to people about how that will work. But there will be other issues coming along, I'm sure, and we have to be aware of them and capable of arguing them. So just in terms of you know, a couple of them specifically, I mean, I've talked about borders there and we do have a few questions in about borders from 
uh, the likes of kind of Tim Ryder, a couple of others. We've got one question from John Robson about currency. We had a few other questions about currency as well. So uh, you touched on it there. You thought that the, 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 the option or the prospectus has to be a little bit more robust on that. So w would you envisage it being the same as uh, as what it was in, in the Growth Commission or, or, or adapted or, or, or work done on it? I mean, it sounds Before like I you think that, that maybe... I just want to make the point that Vini Kennedy Boyle from Butte, nice to see you, Vini, is making belief <laughs> will be the true battle. I didn't ask her to put that in, but she's absolutely right. You know, whatever the topics are, your know, belief will be the battle. We have to believe in ourselves and we have to give people hope and make sure that we are able to communicate to people why we believe this will be a successful venture. We have to have self-belief. And we don't get self-belief if you have too much self-criticism or too much criticism of other people. So belief is really important. I, I mean, honestly, I didn't arrange that, but I think it's absolutely correct. <laughs> Look, in terms of the currency, you know, Nicola has, has made it clear that you know, one of the things we need to do is revisit a lot of the arguments because, to see how the pandemic has changed them and how you know, the, the different, how Brexit has changed them. So I'm, you know, I'm not saying, and it's not my position to say whether or not the position the party has on that should change. But uh, you know, my own view is, Everything needs to be examined critically as we move towards the next referendum so that we are as confident as we can be that we're arguing a case that will work. Um, just, just another quick one just while we're on the, the, the case and what we put to the voters at the next one. Uh, you, you touched on it earlier, actually, just in, in some of you, one, one of the opening questions about, about some of the work that was being done around uh, Constitution. And you said that uh, you thought the SNP should should get involved in that and and and, and work on that. So w this is quite. It's, it's always I always find it really kind of interesting on because it's it's kind of niche, but also it's well, it's a it's a big big kind of thing. But we what we do have um, as a, a readership, and we see it in the letters pages all the time, is that it's clearly an issue that people really want to talk about. And anytime somebody mentions a constitution for Scotland, we end up with a back and forth on the letters page for about four days afterwards. So I am kind of I had a couple of questions from, from Robert, Robert Ingram, John Hutchison, many of the people who, who write those letters. Um, and I'm interested in, in your take on that then. So would you would you put a, a something to the to the people that was the this is this will this will be the constitution of an independent Scotland or well, I I my, I've I've been persuaded by Elliot Bulmer amongst others that mm. you know, my view of this was was wrong in terms of what I thought was being talked about. A constitution is not a prospectus. It, it's not tying down every detail of what's going to happen after independence. You know, independence is about choices. But Eliot's argued, and I think very convincingly argued, argued, that what you need is an interim constitution that guarantees the rights of citizens, that guarantees, you know, that, that puts government in its right place and means that government can't be overweening, that creates a structure which moves you into independence. Then, and, and I... You know, I, 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 as ministerially, I, I was a person who, who brought the, the Citizens' Assembly into, into being. I'm an enthusiast for participatory democracy. Then you need a, an exercise after independence where you have a participatory democracy that looks at how the constitution should be. Sometimes when people talk about the constitution, what they're talking about is laying out in absolute detail the prospectus of how the independent Scotland they want to live in. That's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what we can do just now. If we try to do that now, there was a there's a syndrome in the 19, 1970s and 80s in the SNP called designing the epaulets and the uniforms, where in actual you had to have everything designed, you know, and, and finished before you got there. We can't do that. But the interim constitution idea, I think, is the right idea because it guarantees rights and protects people as the process of independence takes place. So those people who are nervous about independence know that their rights are guaranteed during that process. And you know, you and I might say, well, of course they would be, who would ever doubt that that was the case? But you know, much mischief could be made with that, you know, if, if that's what others chose to do. So we need to make sure that we're putting in place a very, very clear prospectus. Okay, um, we're kind of running, the, the, the time is kind of taken on here, maybe we might run on a little bit, but let, let's take a little break from, from, from independence although not really because it's what everyone wants to talk about but I, w I do want to talk about the movement and i want to talk about the state of the movement and, and where we are with new parties and how everyone can get on and, and all that kind of stuff but i'm interested because you had such an interesting role over the last kind of three four years uh at the heart of the brexit debate at the heart of meeting with ministers in in, in london and i think 
I'm interested in, in, in the UK government and, and ministers and your dealings with them because whenever you came out of a meeting, we always used to think, oh, we're going to get a great news story out of this and, and both sides would put out a pretty bland quote and I'd be left looking for a front page story the next day. Um, Sorry. But now, now, you're, <laughs> now, now you're no longer uh, uh, in government and you don't need to worry about those kind of things. So is it, can, you, can you kind of lift the lid a little bit on, on what, that, what that was really like meeting UK ministers, the likes of Michael Gove, for example, oh, these kind of guys. Yeah, um, it got worse, put it that way. I mean, you know, I thought it was pretty bad when we started uh, because you know, we hadn't voted for Brexit. It was an anathema. I, you know, I've been a strong, profound pro-European all my political life. I remain so. I think the EU is where we should be. It was a hell of a shock to the system. Um, and grappling and engaging with people who appeared to think this was a good idea, you know, was was difficult. And you know, the, the, I did a, a long interview for the, the UK in a changing Europe academic project some time ago. And I tried to explain to them that you had to do this twin track. You know, one thing was you had to keep expressing your opposition and working to try and get the decision overturned. Equally, you had to recognize that if it wasn't overturned, you had to protect things in Scotland that needed protected. So it was always that juggling act and you had to do that the whole time. But actually, you know, you were dealing, first of all, with people in the first iteration of the May government. You were dealing with people who hadn't a clue what they got themselves into and, and had no idea how to take this forward. And it just was a mess. Uh, and I think as you know, they sank into the first year of it, it just became a complete mess. It, it, we, we, I mean, Mark Drakeford, you know, the Welsh first minister, was my opposite number for the first two and a half years. And, you know, he and I just used to sit shaking our heads with astonishment. I mean... There was one meeting of, of the Joint Ministerial Committee when we arrived, there wasn't, there was no room. They had fit, forgotten to book a room. There was nowhere in the House of Commons. He, he described it afterwards to Welsh Committee, Welsh uh, Senate Committee, as being worse organised than the St Asaf's Community Council. It was just a complete mess. And nobody knew what was happening from one day to the next. Those were the good days. It got a lot worse because then the ideologues took over. And they were Hostile. really unpleasant in a sense. Yeah. They were just absolutely determined to do this. And it didn't matter. And it didn't matter who got in their way. They were just going to do it. And they weren't particularly nice people. And, you know, I look back with some fondness now to 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 the days of, of David Davis and others, because at least you could have a conversation with them. You, you know, by the last year, you were just dealing with people who it didn't matter what was said. They were going to lie about it a lot of the time. A good example is the is is the Erasmus project. You know, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland all said, whatever happens, we need to hold on to Erasmus. They said, oh, yes, of course, we need to hold on to Erasmus. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office did a value for money exercise, never told us what was in it, refused to take evidence, wouldn't explain it to us. Right through to the end. Everybody was saying, oh, yes, we're going to keep hold of Erasmus. At the same time, David Frost was negotiating it away. I, I don't think he had any intention of ever signing on to it. Ideologically, he was fixated with getting rid of everything. And it was that type of thing that you were putting up with. Now, you know, from my pos pos position, I, I don't think we could ever do business with them. I think that you know, we are, we're in a position where the only reasonable and feasible step is independence. And we have to find a way of securing that. But I also recognize that they will be desperate to stop that happening. So we had better be very determined um, and absolutely principled. And we have got to get it right. Because if we don't get it right, you know, they will take advantage of everything we get wrong. And, and that's what annoys me sometimes about some of the rhetoric I hear. They don't know, people don't know what they're up against. And they, we really have to get this right. Let's... Um... Let, let's let's talk about the, the uh, beyond the SNP and the the wider independence movement. We've had quite a fractious, difficult election, I think, for for some. I'm, I'm speaking, as, and I mentioned this at the last one. Um, as, as an editor of the paper, it was incredibly difficult because we were getting hammered on uh, all sides for being giving too much coverage to this party, giving too much coverage to the other party, and it, it was it really wasn't an impossible. Uh, line to walk uh, because people only saw the articles that you know they didn't see the other articles that were written they only saw the one that annoyed them and not the other four that they would have agreed with so um what's your assessment of of where the where the movement is at, at the moment i i am trying to repair 
relationships and, and build relationships across the yes movement. I think it's important. This is not going to be 2014. You know, I, I think there, there are a lot of organizations that have existed and done good things and still do things. And uh, we need to, the SNP needs to be part of that. But, you know, primus inter pares, we're, we're not going to be the dominant leadership of that, I don't think, but we are going to be part of it. And that's good. And I think we can work on that basis. And there's some very good people doing things. But the basis of that is, is mutual respect. You know, I mean, there are people who profoundly disagree with what the SNP does. I accept that. So profoundly that they have disagreed that some people have left the SNP. Not a huge number, but some people have. I understand that. But what I can't live with is, is vitriol, hatred, uh, you know, disparagement of others. And we can't work in that way. So what I'm looking for is, is essentially a, a, you know, drawing a line and saying, let's just try and do this in as positive and as least less destructive way, least destructive way possible. And if, we do that, if we can do that, then I think a lot of good work can happen. If we can't do that, then I'm not playing, you know, I'm certainly not getting myself involved with, with people who are going to behave like that. How many members does the SNP have at the moment? I, I don't know. I have no idea what the full figure is, but it is a very substantial number. I, I mean, I, I don't yeah. obsess about membership numbers, nor do I see them every week, nor does the NEC see them every week, nor should they. Yeah. But you, you mentioned there that, that people had left, and I think, I think you know, it, certainly from, from the newspaper's point of view, it was clear that, that you know, at a nationwide le level in terms of the, the actual population, um, the, the, the ALBA vote wasn't as significant as maybe some people would have said it was. But at the same time, I think among really kind of hardcore independent supporters, it was it was definitely a significant faction. We felt that when we were running the papers. I, I'm, I'm not really interested in the, in the kind of motivations of the, of the leaders or the people who, who, who ran. I'm, I'm interested in the the, the members, the, the, the SNP members who, who've been with the party for years, decades, even older members who defected and, and moved to Alba. Do you, do you understand why? Do you, do, you, do you get why? I get some of it. I mean, I, I've, I talked earlier about frustration. I understand that frustration. And clearly they believed that the SNP was not going to deliver for them. I think they were wrong. You know, personally, I, I want to deliver. I know the First Minister wants to deliver. I, th I think they're wrong about that. But I understand it. And if that is their motivation, fine. There are some policy issues, you know, the, the GRA issue has been divisive and some people are, are very fixated on that. Uh, you know, and again, if that is a difference that cannot be reconciled, fine. But I go back, Callum, to the point about how this is done. You can have disagreement. You can have disagreement about, you know, the, ur the way in which the uh, urgency in which uh, independence is pursued and the means by it. You can have disagreement about policy issues such as GRA. What you cannot live with is that type of Extraordinary, well, that type of character assassination, and that just cannot be dealt with. So, you know, that is my bottom line. And I want to work mm -hmm. with lots of people to achieve independence, but I can't work with people whose whose motivation appears to be to destroy the party in which you know I've been a member of for 47 years. I just can't do that. Yeah, Nor can right. I work with people who you know say one thing to your face and another thing behind your back. That has to stop. Mm -hmm. But you know, I don't want this to continue. I'd much rather. That we all just accepted difference and moved on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as editor of the paper, we've I've followed day in day out uh, Scottish politics and particular what's been going on in the, the the independence movement over the last kind of five six years, and I think certainly from the paper's point of view, um, it goes without saying that that in the paper's view, and we've said this in leaders before elections. The SNP is the political vehicle that will deliver independence, and there's there's no other alternative. Right. I, I get that. At the same time, I think we've been frustrated by, um, and I've got I've got a couple of examples here where initiatives that have been announced, which have seemed to propel forward the the case or drive momentum or whatever, haven't been delivered. And I think I think that's kind of where I see a lot of the frustration. I think and I think sometimes people who who've Either who are angry about a kind of or frustrated about a, a sense of, of of nothing moving, as kind of written off as 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 you know people who are are, are kind of a bit crazy and, and and whatever. But when I look at some of the things that 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 we've put on our front page over the last kind of few years, and from uh, 
the, the, the National Assemblies, which in, in 2018 were going to invite people from across Civic Scotland and the wider guest family, but then ended up being closed shop party events that we weren't even allowed to cover. There was, um, uh, I'm sure Nicola Sturgeon actually said it in a speech in, in 2019, where they were going to post independence, a household guide to every home in Scotland by the end of the year. I didn't have it. As far as I'm aware, I've not seen it. I'm sure the work will be recycled and be used at some point. Um, and then even, which is particularly relevant to today, was that the Scottish government said they were going to start uh, publishing a separate set of jazz figures, which was going to show uh, how the, the how the, the economics might look within an independent Scotland, which would presumably take out spending on defence that we wouldn't do or whatever. And it would, it would, it would bring the deficit down to, to here's what the deficit might be in an independent Scotland. And all those things, for whatever reason, and I'm sure there were pretty good reasons, didn't happen. And I think people have looked at that and they've kind of got really excited about several things over the years and then have, have been left a little bit deflated. And I think that kind of thing builds into the sense of frustration that people feel. Well, you know, I mean, there's two ways to approach this, which is to go through every single one of those and to to give a, a good reason why that didn't happen. And, and you know, I, I can't do that because the ones you're talking about, for example, I don't know about. Yeah. The second one is to say that you know, no organisation is perfect. All organisations get things wrong, make mistakes, do things they shouldn't do. They have to learn from it and they have to keep moving. My view is, you know, I've been a member of the SNP as day for 47 years. I can think of occasions when I've been extremely frustrated with the SNP. I, I you know, I, I was out of the parliament between 2003 and 2007 through a, you know, what I did, thought was no fault of my own. And, 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 you know, there were lots of things that I could have criticized. I think if you're in it to achieve independence, you're in it for the long haul. And you therefore have to keep going. And you also have to influence what happens within a party. I, I wrote my column last week about this. You know, what you have to in the end do is to decide whether you're going to change it or try and change it from the inside or whether you're going to stand outside and just shout. And my nature is that I will endeavor to change it from the inside. That's who I am. And that's what I've been trying to do. But, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to justify every single thing that has happened, either in the SNP or in any other form of life, because I can't do so. But I think there is an honest intent to move forward, to serve Scotland well, and I think the government has served Scotland well by and large, and to deliver independence through a referendum. If we possibly can win that, we will win that. Uh, and that's why I'm with it, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. Okay, just one one last thing, because we've got, we got a few questions on, on this before we move on to uh, something that's a bit more constructive and, and next steps and what we can do. Um, and also, I'm seeing someone in the comments there is saying, could Calm speak more slowly and clearly, please? Oh. So I'm trying, I will try and do that as well, <laughs> Lily. Um, thanks very much. Um, just want to quickly address the, the, the so-called missing money. Um, and uh, I'm sure you've seen this. There, there's been various media reports on it. Um, the, there was a crowdfunder for uh, uh, which was stated that the money that was raised would be ring fenced for a second independence uh, referendum campaign. So, what's, what's your understanding as as SNP president, as someone who has been SNP chief executive? What's 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 the truth behind that? Well, uh, Colin Beatty is you know the incoming replacement national treasurer gave a very comprehensive and clear statement of where that money is. That money is available for campaigning for independence. It is accounted for minutely, and it will be spent on independence. The procedures used for it were exactly the same procedures as been used for all previous similar funds, and there was nothing suspicious or devious about it whatsoever. I um, One of the things we do suffer from is you know, a... a, a a malice from some people, which goes on repeating things even when they're not true. Um, I, I also saw, when Nicola asked me to take this job on and the NEC confirmed that, I saw somebody who admitted to falsifying a tweet to say that I was going to receive part of that money. Now, you know, for, for the record, I'm not paid for what I do you know, as president of the SNP or in uh, the independence unit. I haven't asked for money and I'm not given money and I certainly haven't taken 600,000 pounds. So as far as I'm concerned, there is no missing money. This is simply not true. And I think the repetition of it is, you know, is malicious. But, you know, there are some people who will go on believing it no matter what. Uh, you know, and the fact that the accounting methods have remained the same for a very long time and that the accounts have been fully audited and audited and audited and audited and they meet all the legal requirements doesn't seem to matter. 
But we do sometimes live in a sort of post-truth society, but there is no missing money, uh, absolutely none. And that money is being used for independence and it's not being used on me. <laughs> there you are. Okay, right, let's, let's move on. Um, well, one last question, I think, but probably quite a, an involved one. And, and, and actually, I think it's probably the best question we've had because I, th I think it's probably the question I would ask as well. Um, and I think I think this is where most people are, okay, in, in the movement. And I think this is probably where most ACMP members are. And I think where most, most people who want to move forward with the case for independence are. So Ross Buckin says, we're keen to do our bit. And we'd be happy to hear what the SNP are doing in preparation for an F2. But what can we do now? And how can we contribute? Right. Good. Well, there's three things you can do now. One is we need to be positive and to be hopeful, right? So we're never going to persuade anybody if we're going around attacking each other or, or saying, oh, isn't this good for the rest of it? Let's start off by being positive. We've got a great country. Uh, Rini's point about belief. We believe in ourselves. We can do this. So that, that's a mental attitude. The second one is what I'm trying to do in the information we're providing is to give people information they can give to other people. So talk to other people about it. You don't need permission to start to go out to campaign. Talk to friends, talk to neighbors, talk to workmates. You know, and if, the, you're, if you're in the SNP and, and there's a branch that's going out, or if you're in the Yes Movement and you've got work down the Yes Movement, go out and talk to people about it. And there is material. There's a lot of material around. And the third thing, is, is to make sure that you are building your own confidence and independence by working with others, by developing the case, and by saying that you'll, you are going to be an exemplar of how good this is. Now, that sounds a strange thing to do. But what you've got to do is to say, this is, you know, by your actions, by your, by your positivity, by your work with others, you're saying to people, this is where the future of Scotland lies. And you have to be a witness to that, essentially. You really have to do that. Now, that's one of the reasons why the paper is really important. Because the paper gives people information. It reports on things that are happening. It spreads good practice. I'll keep trying to give people material and information. But, you know, just do it. That's in the end of the day. Just go and talk to people. Start doing things. Make sure you're working with like-minded people. Join the S movements. Make sure your SNP branch is, is moving forward and actually active. That's what you can do, and you don't have to wait for it. I think I said earlier, and I just repeat, people in Scotland have a tendency to, to wait to be given permission, or wait to be armed. You know, here's the document, go and do it. Independence is as much as anything else about common sense. We've seen it. You saw it today in the House of Commons. You saw it with Boris Johnson. These are not people who we can either trust to run this country, nor can we even like them. You know, we need to get on and do it ourselves. And that's what we can do. We can go out and say that and go on saying it and make it happen. Yeah, indeed. Lynn Mowat is right. Good old Lynn. Positive, helpful, hopeful, believe in ourselves, talk to people, change minds, be the change. Excellent. You should get her on to do this. Yeah, that, I was going to say it's a lot, a lot more succinct. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think I'm going to give way to Lynn because she's absolutely right. That's exactly. Be the change yourself. Yeah. Good. Well, I, yeah, we, we've certainly got plans coming up. I mean, it's probably breaking some kind of embargo here, but um, if, if it's just for the folk listening, that's fine. Uh, we, we've got some big plans for uh, for for uh, next month where we're going to hold a, a big day of action, printing up to yeah. 100,000 um, uh, special kind of papers, which we're going to ask people to deliver to, to doors. Hopefully, Mike, you can get the, the, the party and the branches involved in that. And, and, and at least I think if we, if we can kind of keep working together on a lot of these things, for the paper, the, the the various parties, the movement, then then I think um, I I've think been talking we're... to the National Yes Network. I've been yeah. talking to Believe in Scotland. You yourselves are involved. I think we can all work together. And if we can focus on, for example, the day of action that's going to be, if we can focus in the SNP, we're going to be doing stuff in. You know, I hope we're going to have a material to go in November, October, November that will be going up. We've got a conference coming up. There's a hell of a lot of things we can do, and we should be doing them. Yeah. Be the change, as Lim says. Be the change. And uh, an independence will be centre stage shortly. Well, there has to be. It is. Look, you know, independence has never stopped being centre stage. You know, it, it is the issue that has, Scotland has and we have to resolve. And it can only be resolved by achieving independence. There is no other way to resolve it. 
Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much, Mike. One final question, <laughs> which we're going to, I think we'll probably make, we'll, we'll, we'll say to a lot of people that we, that we have on. Um, sum up why Scotland should be independent. One sentence. It's normal. <laughs> that's a good a good short sentence probably. well you, you know the, the thing about independence is it's treated you know you, you see people like you know in, in in the uk government so pearl clutching and thinking how awful it is it's entirely normal everybody else does it and it works for them so if it's normal and it works for everybody else we need to have it too end of story okay brilliant. well listen thanks very much for joining us tonight mike um, we'll, I'm sure we'll have you back on again, maybe after, maybe in towards the winter when we've, when we've mm -hmm. done a few things together and we've, um, and we've kind of helped build a bit of momentum behind it. We'll get you on uh, again to talk about next steps. But thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who's been watching from home. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, and we'll leave it there. Thanks. <laughs>